So last night I was watching a video of a fellow creator interviewing a famous analyst. Interesting stuff, but one thing hit me straight in the face. Some small NATO air forces can at best generate two four-ship flights a day. So I was catapulted in a rabbit hole and in this video you will see what I found. So in case you missed or if you are very young, bless you, Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991. In a sudden eruption of optimism, many European countries started reducing their military capabilities. At the time it was called the peace dividend, as if reducing military expenses wasn't a direct GDP reduction as well. You can argue that those monies were better spent elsewhere, that was a legitimate political choice, but it wasn't a dividend. The total resources did not increase because of the reduction of military expenditures. Fast forward 2023 and now we all understand that the large-scale conflicts may indeed happen again. And suddenly we realize that European air forces are no longer adequate for the task. Rusi published an excellent report on this subject and it is the inspiration and the main source for this video. However, I believe that they did not see the elephant in the Oh god, how did it find me here? Bye Alfie, thank you for visiting. Otis, did you invite him? Yes sir, after last time we became friends. He is always keen to help. Do you realize that he upturned the edge and ate all the flowers? But he also left plenty of useful organics on the lawn. <sighs> so the Ruzi analysis is indeed excellent, but in my opinion, they missed the one final point. But let's proceed systematically. So the main consequence of the peace dividend was the reduction of aircraft and personnel. And the logical step after that was the closure of air bases and the concentration of all the assets in few large structures. These large bases today have a high concentration of paint targets, a limited number of hardened shelters for aircraft and a little to no ground-based air defenses. Well, I suppose you can always disperse the aircraft to reduce the target density, which was one of the NATO procedures during the Cold War, but all the smaller airstrips and austere bases are gone. And so is the infrastructure and the logistics to resupply and maintain these bases operational. Yes, I know, to be honest, Sweden and Finland do retain this capability and they train it regularly, but they are the exception rather than the rule. And, even in their cases, it is difficult to disperse the critical force multipliers like the AWACS, the tankers or the electronic warfare aircraft. Well, if you actually had enough of those, moreover, while the complexity of maintaining an aircraft at squadron level is pretty much remaining constant or it is decreasing in some cases, the complexity of the weapons used is increasing, so the total work is not changing much. And obviously it is difficult to do everything is needed in an austere base beside a motorway. The other country that practices dispersion is Ukraine and they had to learn it quite quickly. It saved a good portion of their forces from the initial Russian strike, but it severely hampered their operations. You may say, come on, this is not a big issue, the NATO air forces will wipe the floor from any opponent, they will quickly establish air supremacy, and it will be a walk in the park from there. That, 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 that's true, right? That, that, that's exactly what it is. Well, considering that long-range strike capability has been demonstrated beyond any doubt in the last decade, I would not be so sure. Are we certain that while NATO is in the process of establishing air dominance, a volley of long-range missiles won't damage the air bases to the point of rendering them inoperable? Sir, the repair units, sir. Yes, I know, Otis. Uh, actually, the rapid runway repair units have been pretty much disbanded everywhere at the end of the Cold War, so don't count on those. Now, Today everyone is trying to understand how hostilities with Russia are going to be and while Russia has demonstrated these capabilities of long-range strike in the first few days of the invasion of Ukraine. The only thing keeping the Russians at bay now are the Ukrainian ground-based air defenses, which are 
of Soviet origin, and that is it, they are a good proxy of the air defenses available to Russia. On the flip side, as we said, NATO has very little in terms of ground-based air defenses. Don't get me wrong, some of the systems are outstanding, but there are very few of them. Actually, Ukraine was in a better position than many other NATO countries in terms of limiting the Russian air power. Now, uh, for those who are foaming at the mouth, ready to comment below that Russians are just an evil ragtag band of incompetent morons, I'm tired, I'm just tired, and I have better stuff to do. We are often told that the Russian pilots before the conflict in Ukraine flew on average only about 80 hours a year. What we are hardly told is that Western fast jet pilots in the last decade flew from 80 to 120 hours a year on average. Many European air forces, in the face of fund shortages, have chosen to maintain a larger base of aircraft at the expense of trained pilots. Um, well, larger. That, that, that's not very large, to, to be honest. While the United States are in a better position than the European Air Forces, the objective of flying 240 hours a year is only reached by pilots who are deployed in specific missions. These missions are overstretching the current capabilities of European Air Forces to provide the logistic support and execute the appropriate training. In fact, the set of capabilities required to execute large operation at scale in a generalized conflict is very different than those required for air policing or ground support in a permissive environment. In fact, while the pilots involved in a mission abroad may clock much more hours than their colleagues who stay at home, that time is not always valuable in terms of training and experience. Realistic training is very expensive because every flight hour has a cost, it would also require the use and the consumption of real weapons, which are insanely expensive today. Many smaller air forces do simply not have the resources to train like this. The transport in simulators has increased to compensate this issue, but pilots agree that the differences are substantial and it is not a replacement for actual flying hours, but it is rather an enhancement. A specific mission that is only ever flown in a simulator and never in real life cannot be considered as properly trained. Moreover, simulators, which, which by the way are quite expensive themselves, do train just pilots. They don't train the ground crews, and they don't train the logistics required to keep all the aircraft operational and generate the missions. Plus, simulators don't train AWACS operators or flying commanders, planners, electronic support specialists, ground controllers, and so on. As if this wasn't enough, all these factors are contributing to the loss of qualified personnel from the European Air Forces which is only compounding the problem. NATO forces, in case of a generalized large-scale conflict, are supposed to fly complex missions whose ultimate purpose is to acquire air dominance, which is, I would say, mandatory to operate NATO ground forces as they are structured today, in the face of a near-peer opponent. Touch wood. The immense amount of human know-how necessary to fly these missions is very slow to acquire, and it is easily lost by lack of training or by personnel leaving the service. There are two key lessons learned from the Ukrainian conflict that are relevant for European Air Forces. The first is that weapons consumption is on an unprecedented scale. True, there is a lot of non-guided weapons being used in Ukraine, but even precision weapons require numbers much higher than those we are used to, because against a near-peer opponent, there are simply a lot of targets to engage, and these targets sometimes can defend themselves. The second is that even non-integrated air defenses go a long way to denying the airspace to an opponent. The Ukrainian air defenses do not have a significant level of integration, and their main components are 
medium range systems not so new. And yet, this is enough to create big problems to the VKS every time they try to operate above the Ukrainian controlled territory. And please note that a near peer opponent in this case is not only Russia or China, but also countries like Iran, Algeria, Egypt, or Israel. Uh, actually, not that I want to invade any of those, but it is just to be clear what a near peer in this context actually is. And the issue is always the same, air forces have privileged the availability of aircraft at the expense of the availability of weapons and training. And still the funding is such that even the number of aircraft is small if compared to the end of the Cold War time. The weapons that make a Typhoon or an F-35 an effective machine are often available in small numbers and the personnel is not necessarily trained enough to use them effectively. In particular, SEAD and DEAD missions are a craft of their own that require trained specialists, suitable weapons and supporting assets like electronic warfare aircraft. No European Air Force has any relevant SEAD DEAD capability today, despite the fact that they may exist on paper, with maybe the partial exception of France. Sir, this is a humanly disheartening picture. It is, Otis. It is indeed. So, now that we have discussed the problems, let's see if there is a solution. Well, there is the THE solution that is recommit the resources necessary to rebuild the capabilities and reacquire the equipment. This is, well, obvious, <laughs> but it requires a specific political will to do so. Even though most European countries have recently shown an increasing propensity to invest in their own military in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this is more easily said than done. This is sort of the solution proposed by the Rusi in the paper mentioned above. They correctly point out that if we can't achieve our dominance, we need to restructure all our ground forces to operate without it. And that will be an even worse situation. But there is another solution not mentioned in the paper but discussed by the same authors in other occasions. It goes like this. European Air Forces should admit that they can't do everything anymore and they should specialize. A small Air Force should choose a capability, for example strategic transport, and devote all the resources to building and maintaining an efficient transport capability decommissioning combat aircraft, electronic warfare, and any other asset. A medium-sized air force might have more high-end capabilities using the other air force's assets or the capabilities that are missing. I have some perplexities on this solution. In fact, it would be the equivalent of handing over national sovereignty to NATO to a large extent. Smaller members of the Alliance will always lack some capabilities and they will have to make a choice. However, the large European countries, which are still among the largest economies in the world, cannot agree to such an arrangement. You see, governments are accountable to their people and the decision of using the military force should only be in the hands of the people, regardless of any other consideration. This is what I believe, this is a cornerstone of democracy, in my opinion. You may think otherwise, but this is just my point of view. Today, there is no guarantee that the national interest of a single NATO member is the same as the alliances, because the political weight within NATO is not evenly distributed. Yes, I know, I'm aware that do exist formal rules that require unanimity for important decisions. But, like all written rules among sovereign states, they do not matter much. What really matters is power. Hard or soft, but just power. Yeah, I said it's probably not right, but that's how it is. And in fact, I can think of at least a couple of cases in which a country has been de facto forced to act against its own interest because it was part of NATO. If you are a keen observer, I'm sure you can think of a few cases too. Moreover, some commentators say that the events in Ukraine have compacted the alliance. Well, maybe in the face of the media, maybe at government level, maybe at senior military level. But if you look beyond that, at what is the national interest of the various NATO countries, then some clear rifts start to emerge. 
Do you see them? No? Well, just pay a bit more attention. This division wouldn't matter much if there was a clear common danger like during the Cold War. Today the danger is less clear and the NATO has expanded its area of intervention. So in the end, at some point, these diverging interests will emerge and countries will do what is best for them and their people no matter what. Because governments in our malfunctioning but still democracies are still accountable to people. Okay, this is as much as I dare push it into, into geopolitics. Let's go back to air forces. Okay, at this point you may think that I should put forward a proposal. And with no pretense of completeness or authority, I indeed may have won. The first consideration is that there should be a shift in economic policies and recognize that every investment in the military is actually a contribution to the GDP if, and it may be a big if in some cases, the money spent stays in the country. For small European countries, this will always be problematic. But for the five or six largest economies, I'm arguing it is entirely doable. Till the 70s and the 80s, all these countries had a nearly complete industrial matrix. It has been lost during the globalization, but it can be rebuilt. It's not too late, and there are some signs that this is already happening. And actually, France preserved it quite well, and it is the European country less dependent from abroad for defense acquisitions. So, if we manage to turn defense from a cost to an investment, suddenly we have a different outlook. However, we still have the problem of managing the large organization that is required to create a modern and effective air force. So, one possibility, better use the resources, is keeping the force for the most part, not ready. The Air Force could be constituted of a small active force and a large reserve, a model somewhat similar to the American Air Force Reserve or eventually the National Guard, but with inferior readiness. The active force should operate in peacetime with the main purpose of keeping alive a core of high-end capabilities and competences. The reserve should include personnel with a low and outdated level of proficiency that can be recalled in service and brought up to speed with a training ranging from six months to one year, because that is the time that may be necessary for a crisis to fully explode. The personnel should transit to the reserve from the ranks of the active force after having reached a full qualification in some specialty and remain in service for a relatively long time. Personnel should train regularly, say two to four times a year for a total of four to six weeks to keep exercising their basic skills and crucially be aware of what they don't know and what they will need to learn in a hurry if the reserve is mobilized. While it is obvious that a huge and complex organization is required anyway to manage all of this, even because the, the final purpose is to have a larger force with less resources being consumed day to day, the savings overall may be important. For example, all the equipment is subject to less wear and tear and it can last for longer. The consumption of weapons is greatly reduced. Reserve personnel salaries are going to be much lower than those of the active force, but they will be seen as an extra money to integrate a civilian job. A specific legislation should be in place to avoid discriminations of the reserve personnel in the everyday life, because I'm obviously not only talking about pilots here, but all the other 20 to 30 people for each pilot that are necessary to run an Air Force. And obviously plans must exist to bring back the full capability and they should be rehearsed, at least partially, every few years. This model is nothing new, there are various countries that adopt this configuration of their Air Forces. And maybe it's time for us Europeans to think about it too. I'm just saying. Thank you very much for getting this far in the video. 
and an enormous thank you to all those who are already supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one-off donations on PayPal. You can also buy a model from Air Models. There is an affiliate link below. I will get a small percentage and there will be no extra cost for you. I hope you have appreciated this video, which was a bit different than usual. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.